Welcome to the Spiggle Law Podcast. I'm Tom Spiggle, founder of the Spiggle Law Firm, where we help people who've been fired or afraid that they might be. Uh, we talk about uh, cutting edge issues in the news and in employment law. And today I am happy to uh, to welcome one of our fantastic paralegals, uh, Emily Villatoro. And before we get started, though, just a little bit of legalese. Uh, this uh, podcast is not intended to be legal advice, nor does it uh, cre create an attorney-client relationship with our firm. If you want somebody to advise you about your specific case, you got it. You should go see a lawyer. So, Emily, what are we? Uh, what do you want to talk about today? Thank you for having me, Tom. Um, so today, I do want to talk about when employees report to the EEOC. Um, how vulnerable they are within their workplace before getting terminated and what size they should look for um, if they're being retaliated against. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point um, because people, and I think this is something that some folks don't understand, which is understandable in itself, that you can bring an action against your employer while you're still working there. You don't have to wait to be fired. Um, and uh, we've certainly represented a bunch of clients, it's not infrequent for us to represent people who are at their current employer who have, you know, usually the first step is to just, you know, send some letter or email uh, to HR, you know, laying out what's happening. But then the next step is filing with the EEOC. And you don't have to, you don't have to go to HR first, but usually that's, that's the first step, but you can file at the EEOC. And Importantly, why this is such a powerful thing to do is it gives you, as you know, Emily, um, anti-retaliation protection, right? Like it's, in, it's illegal for your employer to retaliate against you for what's, uh, what, what's uh, the 25 cent legal term is, uh, is protected activity, right? Engaging in protected activity. And certainly going to the EEOC is about a bright line of protected activity as you can get. And so the, if the employer does something to you during that time, you have a completely separate case. You have your underlying issue. Let's say it's hostile work environment, which is a common one. You're still in the workplace or failure to uh, to accommodate an ADA claim. <laughs> and then you filed your charge uh, and then your employer, let's say, terminates you after that. You could actually lose the ADA claim. You could lose the hostile work environment claim, not because you're wrong, but because you just, you know, you lose it as a matter of law and still keep and win your retaliation claim. Uh, so I think it's a great topic. Anything else that you see with clients or, or issues that come up? Um, in a workplace, when one employee reports, can you like tag on to their report as well if it happens to you as well? You'd have to file a separate charge, right? You okay. can file a, se a separate charge um, and then, you know, let the EEOC investigator know that, you know, you're at the same company. And I think probably what will happen then is you'll be assigned to the same investigator. And there certainly is, you know, strength in numbers. Um, you know, you could certainly serve as a witness uh, uh, to somebody who's filed a charge, right? You could say, hey, use my name because I saw what went on. I'm happy to talk to the EEOC. Um, and it's also important to know that, that, helping someone who is engaged in protected activity can itself be protected activity. So if you are, you know, uh, helping them with the EEOC process, or maybe you've also gone to HR and let's say this is not what you was also work environment. It's not happening to you, but you saw it happen to a coworker. Mm -hmm. uh, then you also have that anti-retaliation protection, but you can't, you, you can't join in with somebody else's charge. You would have to file your own separate charge, which then probably be, handled by the same investigator at the EEOC, particularly if you're filing at uh, roughly the same time. Oh, okay. And then are, are damages separate as well? Like if you receive damage, um, compensation for what yeah. you suffered and stuff? Yes. Or damages just... are uh, an interesting and a, an important concept to understand when you are still at work and filing with the EEOC or bringing any action. Uh, you still have damages, right? You still can be awarded money for the for the wrongdoing, but usually when you're still at work, unless you've been demoted, let's say you're still at work, um, you you don't have lost wages, right? Because you've still got a job, you're still earning that paycheck, so you don't have lost wages, but you can still get you know emotional distress damages, uh, compensatory damages for any out of pocket expenses. You can still get punitive damages. Uh, so there are still damages available to you, but it is true. Then this is why sometimes we we have had 
people come to us who've been rejected by other employment law firms because um, you know, the, the, these firms say, well, call, call us when you've been fired, right? Oh, because, no. Right. Then, yeah, because then you've got the, you've got the lost wages, which tend to make it, um, you know, the damage is higher. But of course, some people don't want to quit their job, right? That's, yeah. not, what, that's not how they are. They certainly don't want to be fired. You know, so um, you can, you, know, you can still get awarded damages for that. And as a tactical matter, you know, you, um, you've become a thorn in the side to your employer. Because mm-hmm. if the employer has any good legal counsel, uh, any idea what they're doing, then they know that they can't touch you. Or if they do, they risk some kind of retaliation lawsuit. So sometimes right. it can be an effective technique to get a better severance package, the money that they pay you when you're leaving, assuming that you want to leave, mm-hmm. um, because they, they want you out. <laughs> they want their, right. your, you're kind of a, you're kind of a uh, um, I don't know what the right metaphor is, but you are, you are, you know, the call is coming from inside the house, right? You're, you're in the, in their organization, you're all, they perceive you as a liability and you can use that to your advantage. But even if you don't, you're still entitled to get damages, um, you know, if you prevail. Is a severance package something that all employers need to offer or is it something just like something they offer within their, within the company? Yeah, they're not required to offer severance packages. There's no legal requirement for it. Um, there are some very limited, like if you have a contract, right, with your employer, which most people do not, you have to be generally pretty high level to get these. But if you've got a contract, you know, that, that'll that say, you know, if you're terminated for anything other than cause, right, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they have to offer you some set severance package. So those in those limited circumstances, an employer has to offer that. Um, but the rest, the, in every other case, the employer doesn't have to. The, the reason that they want to is, uh, you know, there are a couple. Let, let, let's let's assume that there's been no wrongdoing. It's just that you're, you know, you're being let go. Uh, the employer wants, they want, they want what's called the release of claims, where the employee agrees not to bring any lawsuit against the company. That has value. They also want the, they're called a non-disparagement clause where the employee agrees not to say bad things about the employer, because that's not something the employer can get without that severance package, without that signature from the employee. Yes, you can't go out and lie. You could be subject to a defamation claim, but um, there's no, otherwise, you can, as long as it's truthful, you can go out and say whatever you want to about the company. So they get, by the severance package, they get that non-disparagement clause. Um, there's often can be a, uh, a non-compete in there, um, mm-hmm. which, you know, you gotta be careful with that. Some people don't care about it. Some people do, but to prevent you from going to a competitor. So, yeah. uh, they get the release of claims, they get the non-disparagement and those things are, are very valuable for the employer. For that reason, uh, employers usually will offer severance, but there's no legal requirement in 99.9% of the jobs that you get one. Oh, Okay. And that's separate from getting paid out, like their, your PTO as well, or yes, that's okay. separate. So, um, and it can be part of a severance, right? That you get paid out your PTO, but PTO tends to be a, a state by state issue, right? Some states require employers to pay out PTO. Um, most don't, like Virginia does not. So, if you, unless it is the company's policy to pay out PTO, uh, you're not in title to get that. Some com- companies have it as a policy that, hey, we pay out unused PTO. And that would be, that would gen- that would generally not necessarily have to be part of a severance package, but it can be included in a large, larger severance package, you know, the case. Mm-hmm. and that's something you can negotiate with your employer um, is getting paid out, even if they don't normally pay it out to get paid out for your, for your PTO. Mm, okay. Yeah. I was curious about that because some of employers require like a two week notice in order to receive your PTO. And, you know, some people don't know if that's legal or not. Yeah. It depends on the state. It depends on the state. Yeah. In, in many okay. states that would be legal, you know, that, okay. hey, yes, we pay out PTO, but you got it. Cause otherwise, I mean, this is the other thing about, uh, being in a, in, um, uh, an at will state, which is every state, I think, except Montana, uh, is you don't owe your employer anything in terms of notice. Right. There's no requirement okay. that you give a certain amount of notice. So this is a way for employer, again, to get something that they're not entitled to by law, which is a two-week notice. And so the employer can say, hey, yes, we pay out unused PTO, but you got to give us two weeks notice. Uh, okay. That's yeah. interesting. 
Thank yeah. you for answering my question. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, that's a, that's a great topic. I mean, I think it's important for people to know that you can bring a charge. And sometimes it's a, it's a really good strategy to, to bring a charge while you are still at work. Does it make things fun? No, right? <laughs> you're, you know, you are, you are, uh, you kind of ruin the party when you fly. So yeah, I think people have to be prepared for that. Um, mm -hmm. It's not required that you have an attorney, but it does help at that yeah. point uh, because there are just a bunch of tactical issues. There are going to be ongoing issues with your employer, or there may be, you know, HR may want to meet with you and like, how do you handle that? So it can make things uncomfortable. And I understand that's one reason why people don't do it. Um, but it does make, as a legal matter, it does make your case much stronger and it does put you in a better position to to negotiate, um, you know, a severance. And you say, hey, this isn't working out, company. You know, can we can we negotiate a severance package? And there's nothing wrong with asking, you know. Uh, yeah. Because you just need to make clear you're not quitting. Right? Like, hey, I'm not, I'm not quitting, but if you guys want me gone, you know, I'm happy to discuss, you know, a, a severance package. Okay. Do you recommend bringing an, an attorney to an HR meeting? Usually you can't. Um, there would be some reasons why you, or let's just set the law aside for a minute. There'd be some reasons why you would not want to bring your attorney uh, just because it, it uh, understandably puts, uh, brings everybody's barriers up. Like if you walk mm -hmm. in with your attorney, then your employer likely is gonna, not going to want, want to meet with you unless they have their counsel there. So you may not, it may make, you may not want to ratchet up the intensity uh, that early. So even if you have an attorney who's kind of advising you behind the scenes, which can be very valuable, you might want to go in. It, the company wouldn't necessarily even know you have an attorney at this point. Uh, you could go in and, and, you know, to a meeting and have more of a kind of a heart to heart with HR, which can be useful if you know, like if you've been in the company for a long time and you know who the HR person is, you know, sometimes you can get um, further, right, with some kind of collaborative process. Not always, but sometimes you can get further. And obviously if you walk in, somebody, you know, like me in their suit and tie with a briefcase. Uh, kind yeah. of, <laughs> things. I will say there are some circumstances where you might want to bring an attorney. Um, and let's, let's, let's discuss the legal issues. By law, you are generally not entitled to bring an attorney to a meeting unless there are a couple of a uh, couple of exceptions. One is if it's a unionized workplace and you have what, you know, what's called a CBA or collective bargaining agreement. Um, sometimes you you as part of that agreement, uh, a worker has a right to bring a representative. It's usually the union representative, not the attorney, but sometimes it can be an attorney. But the other way where or other reason you might be entitled to bring an attorney is if your company brings an attorney. So if you walk in, there's your HR rep and there's company counsel. If you're represented, if you've hired a lawyer and this meeting is about whatever it is you hired the lawyer for, let's say it's hostile work environments or whatever, then uh, under bar rules, so this is not like a state rule, it's not like a, on the statute, but by bar rules of every state, it is um, would be a bar violation for that company's attorney to talk to you if he or she knows you at, you're a representative. So you'd have to say, like if, if it's not, if you haven't sent a letter to the company, the lawyer hasn't raised his or her head yet, which sometimes happens in a lot of cases, uh, you would have to say, like I have retained counsel or I just, I have an attorney you know, you have an attorney. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to meet without mine. Um, and I think that's wise because if they brought their attorney there, you know, I mean, they're treating the meeting very seriously. They may mm -hmm. be, not always, but they may be trying to get you to say things unwittingly that might hurt your case. They can almost treat it like kind of a quasi deposition, even though kind of a court reporter isn't there. It's not a real deposition, but mm -hmm. they can really ask you some some tough questions and try to box you in. So. Uh, in those situations, you would be entitled to bring an attorney, but otherwise there's not a legal requirement that your, your attorney will allow you to bring one. And, and, uh, you may or may not want to do that. Again, these are why it's got a good, ideally to have an attorney who's at least advising behind the scenes, cause you're going to ask him or her these questions. Like, Hey, I've got this meeting with HR. This is what I think is going to happen. You know, what do you recommend attorney? And then he or she will kind of give you kind of several strategies for how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, great topic. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me, Emily. It's been very interesting and I will let you get to the next thing on your desk. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. All right. Okay. Actually, before, before we jump off, just real quick for folks, um, you can go uh, get on our newsletter, thecareerrocket.io. 
You can get on our free email list where we discuss a lot of these topics. Uh, and if you found this this uh, interview useful, podcast useful, if you could forward it to a friend, because we want to help as many people as we possibly can. And now, Emily, I will let you get to the next okay. thing I'd like to ask. Yeah. All, All right. right. Thanks, Doc. All right. Okay. Well, All right. Okay.